Hello, and welcome to the Coralosophy Podcast. I'm Chris Muntz. I'm the host of the show, and this is episode 55, Music at the Intersection of Identities with Deborah Stevens. In this conversation, soprano Deborah Stevens and I engage in an open and raw conversation about many aspects of identity and how it affects our concepts of self, as well as our view of the music world. We hit the hot button topics of our own identities and how we see ourselves, tokenism, giving each other the benefit of the doubt, blind auditions, who is this music for, and much more. I don't think you're going to want to miss a minute of this conversation. For those of you who listen regularly, you'll know that I hit some of these hot button topics a lot. And you'll also probably know or you've noticed that I prefer the jargon-free version of these conversations where it's just two people talking, trying to be real. And what I really appreciated about Deborah is that she fell into that super easily. She's just an awesome young musician and young singer. My goodness, if you have not heard this voice, oh my, it's just, it's out of this world. And she's got a career ahead of her that I think we're going to be seeing and hearing Deborah Stevens for quite a while. But what I really valued from this conversation was her willingness to just be open. Uh, Be open, be honest, and tell us how some of these things make her feel. So I think you're going to enjoy it, so stick around. You can find Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy, and for as little as a coffee, send me a coffee a month through Patreon at $3. You get access to a private podcast feed, as well as knowledge of who's coming on the show, topics that are being addressed, the opportunity to ask questions that I can plug into the guests, All kinds of great opportunities over there to get behind the scenes with the show. But I'd like to shout out the the producers on the Patreon page. This is Ulrika Igrain Munoz Alarcon, Chandler Smith, David Kowalsik, James Mock, Kyle Peterson, Michael Heron, Ryan Main, and Stephen Kathy Kakachik. And just a quick reminder to get signed up quickly for the Atlanta convention. We got to get that thing put together. It's April 9 through 11. You'll need to arrange your travel. It's going to be wonderful. It's in Atlanta at a socially distanced, plenty of ballroom space. We're going to try to get about 60 people together. So head to Coralosophy Con 2021 on Facebook for more information, and I can connect with you there and help you get signed up. With no further ado, here's Deborah Stevens. Okay, everybody, I'm here with Deborah Stevens. Deborah is a choral singer, choral scholar, and a choral musician. And that's what we like to talk about on this show. And that's who we like to talk to on this show are people who are engaged in our art form. And I came across Deborah on Facebook uh, as I get to meet a lot of people. And actually, the first time, Deborah, I saw you was in some of those multiple, like the multiple track acapella recordings that you made which were so awesome. And then, of course, I became fascinated with just everything Deborah Stevens. So welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's going to be fun. I I think one of those, I think it must have been during kind of the height of the pandemic when we were uh, mostly stuck in our house. I'm assuming that's why you started making those videos. Or is that something you've been doing for a while? I actually started five years ago. Really? Yeah. I wouldn't even show my face. I would just like hide in my dorm room in college and just kind of sing somewhere where no one would hear me. But it really took off, I would say, this year because of the isolation where I was like, I have to create choir for myself in some way. Would you say that choral music is your passion musically? Are you more of a soloist or how would you describe yourself as a singer? Choral music is definitely at the top. Solo singing is really close, but really there's nothing I love more. Okay, good. We're kindred spirits then. I can sing solos, but that's not where I, that's not where my passion is. I love the the ensemble and especially the small ensemble, um, eight eight to sixteen. Anything more than that, I kind of lose the uh, the the emotional connection to it. That's yeah, that's awesome. So tell us a little bit more about you. Who is Deborah Stevens? Where do you come from? Uh, what got you into choral music? Yeah, well, I am of Nigerian descent. Most of my entire family has been born there, except for me. I'm the first person to be born in Germany. However, we all are American citizens now, but um, that's an important part of um, my heritage, is just having that Nigerian and that German component. But um, music started for me really early. My mom used to 
record me singing and then play it back to me and sort of like she didn't even know she was doing like an oral skills type thing where she'd show me where I'd messed up a note or not and then play it back for me and that's where I started thinking I really like singing. So that started then and I think I'm just extremely lucky that throughout my life I've had a lot of validation that I have a nice voice so I thought okay let me keep doing this. So music and choral singing have been a huge part of my life and a huge part of who I am for a long time. Very cool. So you credit mom with that initial spark. Mm -hmm. Where was your, what was your first, like, I guess you could say choral experience. Was that in school? Was it a church connection? How'd that start? It was at church um, that same year when I was five, we had a little kids choir and I joined that and fell in love with it. Now, do any, any family members also singers as, as far as like their real passion or was it just more of a pastime for them? Yeah, more of a pastime. They can all sing, luckily. And I love telling my brother that um, he could do what I do, but I can't do what he could do because he's an architect, but he's got an amazing voice. And I, I always thought that if he, had take, he, if he had taken it as seriously as I do, we could probably be at the same school, honestly. He's got a great voice. Now, speaking of school, I heard bells behind you. Right. And that was actually kind of cool because it makes it sound like you're in some really cool place. So where are you now? Ooh. Yeah, I am in my graduate dorm at Yale University, one of the larger dorms. But um, yeah, I'm here in New Haven, Connecticut. That's awesome. And finishing up uh, a degree, are you are you done? What's Where do you stand in that process? So I'm in the second semester out of four semesters in my master's in sacred music. That is, that is cool. And is that more of a performance degree, would you say? Or yeah, it can also go by a performance degree because we don't only sing sacred music. That's our focus. Um, and another cool thing that we get to do is interdisciplinary study with divinity school students. A course I'm taking this semester is systematic theology, which is awesome. You wouldn't think that you could get a vocal performance degree and also get to dabble into divinity and sort of Bible courses. But um, on our recitals, we sing music from Hildegard all the way to modern music that was written a year ago, 1950s music. We've got the whole thing. So it's absolutely a vocal performance degree with these interesting stylings of sacred music and religious courses. Okay. Yeah. The reason I asked that is because I was, when I hear about a sacred music degree, I think of um, the maybe church conduct, church choir conductor training, but this mm -hmm. is more of a performance as the, from the singer perspective. Is that correct? Exactly. That's, that's really cool. I, I, I'm old, and I don't know that degrees like that existed when I was in college and graduate school, or maybe they did, and I just didn't know about it. But that's, this that's is a special one for sure. Okay, yeah, that's 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 really cool. So I'm fascinated to dig in a little bit more of your background because you said you you lived at a time in Germany, or is that your other family members? That's where I was born. You were born there. Okay, so born in Germany, but of Nigerian descent. And now, and now American and living in America, your concept of culture must be kind of unique. Definitely, I would agree. Do you, how do you think, do you think of yourself as an American? Do you think of yourself as a Nigerian? How do you, how do you identify in that way? Definitely, um, that was a source of crisis for me, I would say, in about um, later elementary school, I started to notice, okay, I'm different from other kids because of the way I approach culture and just the way that I act, because there's a lot of respect for authority and for other people that comes from my Nigerian culture that people didn't understand. And then I didn't feel German, because obviously I don't look at, no one would look at me and guess that I was born in Germany. And then also wanting to fit in and to feel like an American. So that's something that I, I struggled with for a while. And I, I still think like, what, I, what exactly do I call myself? What am I? And I've learned to kind of feel that is less important. Like my culture will always mean a lot to me. I definitely attach myself to being Nigerian, but I'm trying to create an identity that doesn't have to do so much with where I'm from, mm -hmm. but rather like who I'm becoming and what I believe in and what I'm going to be. Yeah, I love that. I, I think that's a wonderful thing. And it's interesting because in... Um, I don't know if you've noticed this in your world travels, because it seems like you've you've probably been around different places that uh, that many of us have not. I feel like the our sense of identity uh, as Americans, we treat that concept differently than many places in the world do, um, where we we can we might put uh, quite a bit of weight on the on the skin color itself 
uh, versus even the language that you grew up speaking, whereas some places in the world might place their identity around that language connection. Some places mm -hmm. in the world might place that identity around, like you said, thing, th uh, things we believe in, our religion or other types of things as kind of a core sense of self. So that's interesting because I, I don't know if, you, have you ever noticed the difference in how the how Americans approach that as different than maybe how Germans approach that or how Nigerians approach that concept in general? Mm -hmm. There's definitely a really strong sense of nationalism and patriotism in America, which is it's not that way in Germany. Um, it's rather kind of discouraged. So that was mm -hmm. interesting to find that, um, you know, so much proud to be an American. We really look forward to our, our special national days. And that's something people love to stamp on themselves, which is totally fine. It was just different for me. Um, in Nigeria, you know, there's, there's a lot of political turmoil, but there's also this sense that Nigeria will rise again. And there's a lot of hope for the country becoming greater and a sort of superpower that they believe that it can be. So there's hope in that sense. So that's kind of three different ways that I can approach it at once, my sense of nationalism, which is kind of what kind of turned me off a little bit. I think it should be more about culture and values, whereas having to tell everybody, well, from Nigeria, but I was actually born in Germany, but I am an American citizen. It's like all of those things don't necessarily tell you something about me until I break it down into culture and values. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. I actually would like it if you would tell me how you feel about this, but I'm going to demonstrate by how I think about this. So I kind of have a con like my own identity. When I think of my own identity, uh, who am I when I look in the mirror? I think first that I'm a father and a husband. When I think about who am I and what are my important things, that's where I am first. I, I then think of myself as a teacher because I value that part of who I am and what I bring to, to the world. And I care about my students and I, um, I'm always worried about them. So I, when I try to think of how do I identify with who I am at the core, I, I'm a nurturer. I want to take care of people. I want to, you know, all these types of things. And then of course, third down on the list, I kind of think of myself as a musician because music gives me passion and I, um, it, it lights up my mind. It lights up my brain, you know, all this kind of stuff. And then maybe down from there, I would think about myself as uh, an American, but I, I don't often think that way. I just think of I'm, I'm all those other things. And so by the time I get to this point, I'm, I'm getting into a part of my identity that I just don't think very much of. Um, and then like way down the list would be like as a white person. And mostly that's when people tell me I'm white because up until that point, I don't think about it, which there's a lot of reasons for that. And I, I've grown up in a majority white place so that I never, I don't ever have to think about that. Um, how, it, how would you rank? Like, so do you play that game with me? Uh, how do you think of yourself and in what order? Mm -hmm. Passion is something that I really marked by. So I would, I would think that I'm a very passionate person. I'm passionate about music, about my friends, about my family, about people in general, about the things that I like. A musician, that definitely comes up very strongly second. Uh, a daughter, a friend. But yeah, I think that where that race starts to come in is when I walk down the street, I'm extremely aware that I'm a black woman. Uh -huh. And other people, that's the first thing they think when they see me too. Oh, she's black, a black female in this extremely white dominated town. Or else I feel like if you're a white man, people aren't, they don't register white male in their brain when you're, when they see you. It's just like, this is a person. Right. But for me, that's really strongly what people first see. And I get that because of comments that people make to me or excessive staring or too much looking or I'm thinking of an experience I had today. I was running and there was a black male out and he was like, hey, it's nice to see us. And for a moment, I was like, us, I don't know you. What is us? Oh, reminding me, OK, I'm black. Mm -hmm. And he's saying it's nice to see someone else who is black because that doesn't happen often here. So I feel like the world wants to constantly remind me that I'm a black female when that's something that doesn't cross my mind and half the time. If I don't have to think about it, I'm not thinking about it. I'm trying to think of creating who I am. Right. That's beautiful. I think, I mean, I think that's a beautiful sentiment. And so one thing that it, you'd kind of have to dig a little bit to find it, but a, a commonality between you and I uh, is that we don't think of our race as our identity, unless it gets placed upon us. 
Right. And I think then, then the difference would be it gets placed on you a lot more often than it gets placed on me. And, and because that's like a visual trigger, like you said, I, I completely agree with that assessment. I think what's interesting is that it's probably a relatively human or a human universal that we don't think about those things until we get forced into a situation. Now, uh, in a white dominated classical music world, how does that play into your, you, you mentioned an experience walking down the street. Is this something that you run into on a regular basis in the music world too? I am really excited to tell you guys about mymusicfolders.com. Of course, there is the Resonance Singers Mask, which is making a lot of really high quality singing possible right now during the pandemic. And it looks like we're going to need them still for a while. So make sure you head over to mymusicfolders.com and grab your choir, a set of those. And then while you're there, especially as things return to more normal, you might find all kinds of other things that you need. Your choir folders, mymusicfolders.com, obviously, it's right there in the name. But then there's also mychoirrobes.com, which is a partner website where you can get really in, uh, inexpensive and high quality choir robes, which is a non-gendered solution for your choir uniforms. And the beautiful thing about this is when you're making a purchase for your entire school, you can enter Coralosophy at checkout to get a 5% discount, which on a, a school-sized order, that's a hundreds of dollars oftentimes in savings. So I recommend you head over to mymusicfolders.com and or mychoirrobes.com and use Coralosophy at checkout. Yeah, um, it hit me during auditions for the specific program that I'm in right now. Um, I guess it was last February and all of us were in the room because it was a sort of get to know you activity. And I finally realized, oh, I'm the only person of color in this room right now. And that's happened to me many times at like singing auditions and competitions where I take a minute and I'm like, wait, I'm the only one. But for a long time, it doesn't actually hit me at first because I'm looking at everyone as another person and I'm not thinking of my race. I'm just trying to connect and to stay focused on what I'm doing. But every once in a while, I'll realize why is it that in this classical field, I'm always either the only one or there's one or two other people. Do you have theories? What, tell, tell me about that. I think that it starts really early. I think kids three, four, five years old can already kind of tell where they can see themselves. And coming from a minority and just thinking of the school that I grew up in, classical music was not something that they pushed on us. Mm -hmm. um, even choir wasn't that important. Like it was just the core classes and more of a survival and don't do drugs and just more of the core things that I guess the kid has to find out. There wasn't a lot of like dance or arts or any other exciting things that maybe we could end up doing. And, you know, I look to music, I see Beyonce, I see rappers and hip hop, and that's where I saw myself. And that's where a lot of other kids who are in minorities are going to see. When you get into, I'm talking about socioeconomic status and now, but you know, we already know that minorities are overrepresented in poor communities. Mm -hmm. When you get into those better communities, these kids are able to see so much more. And then because classical music is already white dominated, they're going to see themselves more easily in that community because they see, okay, white people are doing this, I can do this. Whereas a young black child might see that and be like, okay, I guess black people don't do that. Especially the way kids think. They'll assume something before they ever ask a question a lot of the time. Right. And I think for me, the difference came in that there was choir in the third grade and we sang a piece that was influenced by Dvorak's Ninth Symphony. And I remember telling my teacher, I love this song so much, what is it? And he told me that. And I was like, wow, like all these crazy words I've never heard of, can you tell me some more? And he noticed that interest in me and he kind of fed it and he showed me some other music and printed some lyrics out for me for, um, I can't remember the composer, but it was a classical piece. And I remember thinking, I love singing this way. I really like this. And I kind of stuck with that. And that's how my journey sort of was able to change for me but I think that other minorities don't have that experience and they never get to see themselves represented. Whereas I kind of forged my own path because I wanted to be that person that could show others that they could do it. Right. Yeah. I feel like as, as a teacher, I've had um, so many experiences with um, students of color being 
kind of having their eyes just pop out of their head when they hear certain types of music and that they just, they just love it. And it's one of, uh, of course, that's true of all of my students, but I, I teach uh, in, my audience has heard this background before, but you probably haven't, which is that um, the school that I teach in is kind of middle class. Uh, it's relatively diverse in the sense that like, if you think about how the, um, the whole, uh, the proportions of, of racial breakup in the entire country, we're, we're similar to that. We're majority white, but we've got, we're not all white, right? So we have um, a little bit of everything. And so my choir classroom is that way too. And so one of the things that I picked up on, again, I'll mention that I'm old, um, and the, this, the idea of speaking in terms of a lot of the, I guess, the social justice language we're, that we learn now to speak in, uh, I started teaching when that was not a thing, right? We just, it, it was the more colorblind generation, uh, which I've always, I've always felt like there, there was a certain progress that had to happen from my parents' generation uh, to, to, to get into a colorblind generation. And then we figured out that that wasn't quite enough. We need to, we need to figure out, um, how, how to, how to present this idea of representation to our students because of the exact thing that you just said. Uh, the, the top choir in my school was entirely white for a long time, mostly because the community was, but, uh, it wasn't until I had some, uh, really brave, kids, a couple young black boys about seven or eight years ago that, you know, there weren't other black kids in this choir, but I finally convinced them to do it. And it opened the floodgates for other black kids later uh, to realize, oh, it's, that is something we can do. Like, and, and it's, what's strange is I think you're exactly right. You're onto it exactly, which is that in many cases in kids' minds, it's not necessarily a conscious thing. Like they, they see it and assume, even though they never, they would never, have asked me, oh, hey, Mr. Munts, can can black kids be in this choir? Because of course they, I would have been, yes, of course, uh, but they don't see that happening. And so it becomes a detriment to, to that. Um, so my next question is really more about the music itself, because you mentioned you fell in love with the Dvorak uh, thing right away as a, as a young kid. Did the idea that um, that we might hear now, kind of in more you know twenty twenty language, uh, the idea that that is white music, would that have crossed your mind at that age? I think so. Really? So, so yeah. But you loved it anyway. How'd that happen? It did represent a sort of schism for me in my mind. The fact that I liked that music, and then I also liked black music. Uh huh. I think I did think about that and. It wasn't until probably high school that I allowed myself to like really only listen to symphonies and choral music and instrumental like Western early music type music because I think deep down I thought as much as I like this that's not what I'm supposed to be listening to or like it doesn't make sense for me to let myself like this so much because people like me don't do this. I was still kind of stuck in that box of not seeing myself in that kind of music. That's fascinating. So you really had kind of an internal battle, like an internal struggle over, you know, allowing you to follow your passion. Are you done with it? Like, are, do you still struggle with that? I think I do a little bit. Um, one of my relatives was hearing me sing a solo probably about a year ago. And one of his comments was, you sound like a white girl. Mm. And I was like, how do I take this? Is this a compliment? is this an insult? Like, how do I, what does it mean for him to tell me that I sound white? And I understand to him, it's because he's thinking white people sing operatic or classical music. So it's a compliment to tell me that. But to me, it's like, okay, so black people can't sound like this unless they're trying to be white. So I kept thinking, is that what people think of me as a sort of sellout? Because I do this, should I branch more into R&B music? Should I rap? Should I sing more soulful music so that I can represent myself? Am I misrepresenting myself by wanting to go in this classical field? Which I resolve that it's not, but I still think about it sometimes that am I holding out on a piece of myself by doing this or am I allowed to just like what I like and sing how I sing? Yeah, man, that's tough because I... I see a kind of an internal contradiction in the way we, and I say we as like a, a profession, the, the choral, choral music and classical music profession that we speak about this because 
in one hand, we talk about how we want more people of color in our classical music organizations. But then on the other hand, we allow rhetoric like you just described to continue to take place, which is that there is, you know, black music and white music. And, and, and my concern is how many other little kids, other future Debras might have a passion for something, but not be able to fight through that, um, that cognitive dissonance or that internal struggle of, is this music for me? Um, and I wonder how do you think we might solve that just kind of shooting off the top of our heads here long-term, how do we make it so that the music is just our music? graphitepublishing.com is a website that sells sheet music directly to you in PDF form. And it's got a stable of composers that you know, and they're all so fantastic. Many of them have been on this show in composer exposure episodes. Uh, Christopher Harris, Eric Barnum, David Von Campen, Jocelyn Hagen, Tim Takash, just so many more. Joshua Shank, they're just great composers on there. And oftentimes these are composers that publish other places as well, which is why you know their names. But Graphite is a unique entity and a great company led by Tim and Jocelyn. And they are giving voice and giving ownership to composers in the digital music format, which is convenient for you, meaning you get the music right away, but it's also very helpful for the composers. They own a bigger share of what they sell. So it's a good way to support living composers. And also they have an amazing search engine on there, which allows you to zero in on the exact kind of song you're looking for and it pulls it right up for you. So I highly recommend heading over to graphitepublishing.com and using Coralosophy at checkout to save 10%. I'm actually involved in a project that has that at the heart right now. Ooh, cool. Um, we haven't like really solidified it yet, but I will say that we're interested in starting something that's like a PBS show. That would be about music, kind of like Mr. Rogers plus music education, uh -huh. where I would be the face of it so that kids who are between the ages of like two, three, four, five, six years old is kind of our goal, maybe seven and eight. So that they would see a show like that where someone like me was being represented and talking about music. So already so early on, they start to see, oh, okay, in the back of their minds, oh, black people like this too. Black people do this. I can do this. It's totally normal. This is an everybody thing. It's not just classical music is white people. So I think that representation really early on, visually and audibly, them being taught about classical music from an African American would really stick in their heads. I don't think that there's a lot of hope for challenging that when we start so late, because people will think, well, let's go into high schools or let's hire more black people to work at the, the audition desks. By then it's already too late. Mm -hmm. I think we have to go way, way earlier. I agree. There's, and this is kind of where I, I hinted to this earlier, where the, there was the progress uh, through in generations from my dad's generation to my generation, which we were raised to be a little bit, to be more colorblind. And when we were taught that it was, I, I believe in the best of intentions, meaning if you grew up in the in the 90s, your parents were super racist or your grandparents at the very least. My, my, my dad was cool. Um, but my my grandpa my grandparents generation, that was fairly normal. And and so we were taught, well, surely then the reaction to our previous uh, generation would be, let's just not look at it at all. Like if we just start fresh, press reset on race in America, you know, this is 1988, 89, 90. That was kind mm -hmm. of the mentality. That was that was actually the liberal progressive way of thinking about it back then. And, <laughs> and so the problem, of course, was that what they missed was exactly what you just brought up, which is that you can't just press reset now with adults who have already been raised a, a certain way, or maybe they've been deprived of the best possible education, or maybe uh, they've been denied experiences because of their skin color, because where they come from. And so in order to, I, that's why I asked earlier, how do we solve this long-term? Because I don't see this as something that you can fix tomorrow because mm -hmm. like you said, you've got to get to kids when they are forming their perceptions of what the, what is available to them in the world? What is for me? What is, what could I possibly be? And what, because that's when they dream, right? At age five, six, it's when they start to picture, I'm going to be a marine biologist or I'm going to be whatever. And that's when we need to get stuff in front of them. And I, I think that 
um, while all the other stuff that we're doing in classical music to try to um, you know, make make more scholarships available at the college level, uh, make sure we're programming diverse stuff uh, mm -hmm. at, in the concert halls, all that stuff's great, but it's not gonna fix the next generation because those little kids aren't coming to those concerts. Right. So that I think that's a I think that's a brilliant idea. Um, tell me more about what uh, about what this show would uh, would do. I know you're still like this is not the topic of our conversation, but I'm interested in like so what would what would you be teaching kids specifically in this show? Um, we would start with it'd be early music focus because that's what we're the type of musicians that we are is sacred music, but. Um, just showing them Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, sort of that information coming from someone like me. And then there would be some performances as well. Um, we're still thinking about the script and what else we want to talk about and about bringing in not only just the Western side of early music, but also Eastern and African sources. But there's that's a lot of research to go into. That's another angle we're thinking about. Right. Yeah, that sounds brilliant. And and I want you to keep me posted on that after we're done talking. I want to know, I want to know how you're doing with that. Maybe I can help. I'd be happy to help with that, promote it or whatever. Cause that, that sounds like an awesome, an awesome thing. So my next question is kind of still still digging into the music specifically that you love and that you're passionate about and that we're it sounds like we're very much on the same page in terms of trying to um expand or I guess you could say widen the net of who, who gets to think of themselves as part of this musical tradition. Because I, I actually studied early music as well. That was my focus in graduate school, uh, performance practice of particularly, my thesis was on the performance practice of French and Italian early Baroque, 1600, 1640, approximately. Um, and I, I was, my, my task was to be comparing and contrasting uh, the choral performance practices of those two places at that time. And it was super specific and super nerdy. And I was, you know, of course, reading manuscripts in French and, and in Italian and doing all of that. And, um, and what's interesting is I, and the reason I bring that up is partly because it's fun to think back to 20 years ago, but also um, that I'm not French or Italian. Um, but yet I found those, those music, musical traditions fascinating. And I, I found digging into the history of it fascinating. And, and so I wonder too, if in, in my mind, and we covered this earlier where I, I don't face the same um, having my race shoved in my face on a regular basis as you do. And I, I, I don't want to compare it in that way. Um, but what I'm interested in is that when I'm studying that music, I'm able to study and enjoy that music that's not, uh, you know, of my heritage or, you know, background directly, while also uh, having more, having a connection to the music that I did grow up learning. And now, so my musical culture growing up was Methodist, hymnody, um, kind of middle, Midwestern, rural church music. That, that was, that was, that my mother was a music director in a, middle of nowhere, Kansas church. And that was the kind of music I grew up in. And I actually still really enjoy that music, even shape note singing and, you know, other types of things that I think is really cool now. And the reason that's all, this is all a big, long question, but what I'm spinning it back to is when you love early music, when you love uh, motets, I'm assuming uh, like acapella, small polyphonic ensembles, is that your jam? Yes. <laughs> okay. See me too. I, I, I just actually got to sing some of that today outside in the cold. Um, it, it, was, it was fun. Some, uh, some Morenzio and some Morley. Uh, it was secular, but it, it was still polyphonic and I loved it. Um, but, uh, and, and so you can love the, that music and still I'm assuming love music that is, you, you used air quotes for those listening, watching on the YouTube channel, black music earlier. Can't you like, can't you love it all? Yeah. That and see that's what I want to teach kids. The music world is a buffet and you get to walk through and pick your favorite things. Is has that been your life experience? You feel felt like you have to fight for that. Definitely have felt like I have to fight for that and I think I've lost a bit of it along the way. Um over this summer I found my old iPod 
from music I was listening to in middle school. Mm-hmm. And I realize some of that I'm completely averse to now. And I wonder why is it that I had to put that away in order to switch to what I prefer now? Hmm. It was the likes of, like, I don't know if you know who Mandisa is. She's a fabulous contemporary Christian singer. Um, um, she's African American. And then just a lot of, like, Jay Z, Beyonce, I've mentioned already, um, Usher. Um, just thinking of all those names of what I really liked to listen to back then. And now I don't listen to it at all. And it's not bad music. I just. I don't enjoy it as something that I would pick to want to listen to. And I wonder, why did I have to do that? Why did, why can't I just still have that interest and still have this one? Why did I feel like I had to turn off that part of me? Because that's the music I grew up listening to. Mm-hmm. A lot of um, African-American contemporary church music, think like Total Praise and those kinds of those kinds of songs is what I grew up with, but I don't listen to now. I think it has something to do with having to rebrand myself in order to be effective in this classical community. That could be, although it also could be that you're a student immersed in that, mm. you know, and, and I, I'm not trying to, of course, diminish your, your thought there at all. I'm just, I'll play old guy privilege on this one, which is that I, I went through a phase like that too. So I, I went through a phase in graduate school in particular where that was my, eat, sleep, breathe, drink, polyphonic music. Like that was everything I was doing. And I loved it, still love it today. Uh, but my my time, like just my time to expand into other things and to care about other things has increased. So there's hope. You, <laughs> you'll, you'll get back to it, I'm sure. Uh, but that's really cool. So, so all these things we've been talking about so far, we were kind of thinking about how um, how our identities intertwine with our musical tastes and with our musical practice and uh, the things that we enjoy, things we, that we don't enjoy. If you could describe your most ideal scenario, so like if you could describe how the classical music world should look, you could snap your fingers and describe how we treat all these issues. Uh, and how would you how would you set that up for the next generation if you had the power? I've given this sort of question a lot of thought and I just I know what sounds like the right answer would be a perfect representation of every demographic I don't really know what the right answer is I think there definitely needs to be more representation of minorities but moving forward I'm not sure what that's going to look like and what would be best for everyone to see Um, there's still the question of you know, Western music that we study, like that Burkholder book that everybody has. Um, we're studying music that's from France and Germany and that whole area. And do they have a claim in wanting to represent their music? And the whole question of are white choirs allowed to sing spirituals? Like, is it okay for all of that mixing to happen? Who gets to represent what and what's appropriate? What's appropriation? Um, I just, I don't feel like I have the answers for that right now, but I think that we are moving in the right direction, being sensitive to each other mm-hmm. and understanding that there needs to be more representation. But I don't think anyone can really say what the perfect look is meant to be just yet. Yeah, I agree. I think describing like a perfect ratio of how, how much representation of each race and culture there is, and I don't, I don't know that that's the right way to think of it. I think for me anyway, the more... Uh, the way I would describe that ha- really has more to do with an attitude of the, our attitude of openness towards uh, curiosity about all things music, you know, and, and then the next step from that, I think it could, I guess, maybe even vice versa, this, an attitude of true curiosity about each other as humans. Um, because if, if that kind of leads, if we lead with that curiosity of, with each other if, as humans, like I, I'm meeting you right now and we're talking and I'm trying to figure out what's going on in your head and we're, and you're talking back to me and we're getting to know each other, at least on a, um, on a surface level, right? Well, let's say someday we have the fortune of getting to sing together. Well, then we would uh, be getting to know each other on the next level. 
right? And and as as I sing with you and as you sing with me, I personally be, believe that music has this like kind of magic power in this way where you know, seven, eight bars into the first piece, we've forgotten that I'm white and you're black and I'm a baritone and you're a soprano. And all of a sudden that's just, you know, that's what we are. That's who we are in that moment. And then I think we could, you can go back after the rehearsal's over and you can ha- still have conversations about race and about culture and about, you know, economics or whatever it else is that we want to argue about or, <laughs> or, or whatever. But in that moment, we can be just music, just sound waves. We can just be sound waves in that moment. And I think that's that. So to me, if someone were to ask me that question, uh, even though I'm hosting the show, uh, what the perfect classical music world is, is is a world where we can just be human in the rehearsal. Mm. And I don't know, I don't know how to get there, but that's, that's what I feel like would be the ideal. Because then I think all the other, the, the ratios and all the quotas and all the idea of like what percentage of this, I think a lot of that would work itself out if, if everyone felt like they had a voice. Uh, another thing I want to touch base with you on, uh, and this is going to just be to lighten the mood just a little bit. I want to go back to your multi-track videos. There, was a, there were a couple in there where I could swear you're singing like a bass part. Yeah. Was that legit your voice? Absolutely, yeah. My range is um, the F sharp below the bass clef staff, and then four octaves and a little bit above that. I can occasionally sing the high B above high C if I'm really well rested. Oh my goodness! So what? How would you describe your fach? I'm a lyric soprano. Okay. Funny, I may have all of that range, but where my voice sounds the best and where I've been training the most, and just the beauty of it, definitely relies in that lyric soprano range. Okay. Cause that was a mate. Like, that was one of the first things that caught my ear when I watched one of your videos as what I was hearing that bass part. That was pretty incredible. In fact, after we're done recording this, I want, I'm, I'll shoot you an email and I want you to pick your favorite one of those. And I've got a, I've got to link it in my show notes so that people can see. Cause if people have not heard these videos that you made, uh, they've just got to hear them. Uh, I made a couple of those during the pandemic just cause I was bored, but I, I'm, I definitely have not <laughs> made very many. So a couple more, one more question really that I think will start us off on a slightly different tangent here. In a written communication a while back, and it was something about being annoyed that you are so frequently being kind of put in a box of being a black musician. Mm-hmm. Tell me about that. What what uh, What is that experience like? And what are situations where that comes up? And, and why do you think you feel that way? Um, I think that with, especially... In 2020, the whole, and Black Lives Matter was a thing before then, but when that really politically became super important and everyone started to realize that black people are underrepresented and um, just targeted, that suddenly I became important to a lot of people who I wasn't really that important to before. Um, I won't name names. Some of them have done it well, but there are organizations that have just wanted to spotlight me out of nowhere um, places where they just wanted my picture to be there for some reason. And um, even a lot of friends who were suddenly just sort of talking to me or wanted to know what I thought, wanted to associate themselves with me, wanted to post me on their profile, wanting to share music that I've done, and just this whole influx of wanting to share black things. And it upsets me because I think that I am a good enough musician that I should be able to achieve that as a musician and not just getting shown because I'm black because I didn't do any there's no merit in the fact that I'm an African-American I was born this way I didn't do anything there's you know I didn't work hard and practice every day and stay up late nights and study and isolate myself and try to be great just to be shown off because I'm black and that's what's trendy right now I think it, it does a it's a bit of an insult to the fact that I have worked hard to be a good musician when it's just because I'm black you want to show off that there are black people in your community or black people in this ensemble or black people that do this thing because it's like why am I only important to you now when I am on the same level as other people that have been shouted out in the past it's just now you notice me right so you would in a sense you're describing being tokenized yeah, that's the perfect term for this. Yeah, yeah, that sounds 
uh, I mean, I can't imagine what that feels like. I, I just, I can't imagine what that feels like. And, and it has to be in, in some way, even though, even though you're being lifted up on a, on a pedestal in a sense, I would imagine it has to also feel belittling at the same time. Have you renewed your Sight Reading Factory membership yet this year for you and all of your students? If not, get started. It's not ever too late, in my opinion, to give your students the gift of confident literacy and the empowerment that that brings. It's amazing what happens when you really start to see the growth and you see that confidence build in their eyes. You can always use Coralosophy at checkout to get 10% off your whole order. For a school's order, that's a big savings, and you can use that code every time you renew each school year. It does, and then there also comes the fear that are people thinking, oh, she only has that because she's black, or they only picked her because she's black, or they wanted black people right now. You know, even affirmative action is another issue. People are thinking that people are only getting into college because they're black. So we have to defend ourselves again that we were we got here by merit and by scholarship and by academic success. So it's both of those where I'm feeling belittled, but now I'm also feeling like I have to defend that I really am good enough. Right, so almost, that, yeah, almost like you'd have to feel like you have to be X percentage better than anyone else who's auditioning for something. Just, just. I've already thought that forever. That's that's another conversation that maybe we'll talk about. Um, one of the earliest things I've ever remembered my dad telling me was, "I have to be three times better than the white person if I want to get the job," which is a huge driving factor for both me and my brother for how hard we have worked over our lives because we knew that there was you know something that had to be crossed in order for us to stand out to be noticed. And it's getting better, but then it's also becoming because you're black, you've got it. Right. And that's, yeah, that's kind of what I was getting at, which is that it's there. It's like a two, the two, two sided weighted scale thing, you know, the scales of justice um, where you put too much on the um, on one side of, you know, being raised. And I I've heard many, uh, people of color and uh, say the same thing that you just said, which is being raised with the idea that you've got to be better to get the job. And then you fast forward to 2020 and here you are feeling like you um, have are getting stuff that you didn't earn. And so it's almost like then the, the, the pendulum swings the other direction. And, and I still, I think, man, that sounds like it's even with that tokenization, which has to feel awful. I, I, I imagine that the people doing it are probably not intending to belittle you. Uh, like, you know, they're, they're, they're probably even thinking I'm doing something good right now. Do you get that sense? Yeah, they definitely are proud of themselves. And, um, and I know it's so hard right now because nobody can get everything right. Yeah. The, the last thing I want to say is, um, actually, this is wrong or this actually makes me feel this way because people have um, a low tolerance for how much correction they can take before they're like, well, this is too hard. I can never get it right. Mm -hmm. And it changes over time. Like who knows, maybe in a hundred years, maybe I've said something that's not going to be politically correct anymore. But I think that for right now, we just all have to like throw away being so easily offended and just be open to listen more. Mm -hmm. So I think that they are really happy with themselves, but at the same time, there's a little room to just be careful about whether or not we're doing the right thing. And then we also have to show more grace and to not beat it down on their heads and be like, by the way, I'm really upset with you. How could you mess that up? How do you not know? Like, it's very different lives that we're living here. Mm -hmm. There has to be a lot more grace shown. Yeah, absolutely. Because it, it, I think really the, what, what gets at it more than anything else is conversations. You, you that we have to open ourselves up to the idea. That's why I do a podcast because I noticed that there are conversations around even topics like this, when they are stuck on social media become toxic instantly. But in a, if we sit down and talk for an hour, uh, there's all kinds of things that we can come to recognize in each other, recognize in our common humanity, um, that maybe we don't come out of the conversation agreeing on everything, but we, we see where the other person's coming from. And, and so I think this is one of those topics too, or your experience where a lot of these types of that tokenization, uh, I saw in 2020 because I saw it happening too, 
to other people. And if we weren't, if the, if that whole um, presenting myself as a good person type idea during 2020 wasn't stuck to social media, I think those things would have been easier even on someone like you, because you, you would have been able to have a conversation, but with people and tell them how it made you feel and all of those things. But in a lot of ways, and this is just me guessing now, um, we were, we were locked down. We were on stay at home orders. We were, um, having restrictions like less gatherings, you know, stuff like that. And some of these things, it's harder to have the conversation. Did you feel that at all during 2020? Absolutely. And with things having to occur over text as well, Mm -hmm. you can't convey the same sense of compassion and of understanding and of patience when you're texting with somebody instead of seeing them face to face. There's so much nonverbal that helps to soften a conversation and to help someone be more receptive to what you're saying than just another post. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had to have a, have that conversation with someone or have you had the opportunity to, to say, I, I feel tokenized by this. Like, and here, let me explain why. I think over text I have with my closer friends who I know are able to listen to me and who aren't mm-hmm. going to get riled up immediately and be like, oh, I'm just trying to do the right thing. Um, I've made some bigger blanket posts on my social media. And the unfortunate thing about that is you just see your followers drop and you don't really get to know who took offense at that and seek them out and be like, wait, why are you upset? I didn't mean it in that way. Let's have a better conversation instead of you just like clicking me out of your life. Mm. Um, yeah, it's it's not so easy to have the face-to-face because of COVID. And then also, who do you know will be able to take it and have a safe conversation with? This is something that it's tied to my well-being as well. It really hurts to have to talk to somebody who won't get it and who will lash out backwards. So I can't um, have that conversation with just anybody or a lot of the people who I wish I could tell about it. I can tell that they're going to really like disrupt my own peace. Right. There's another thing. Do I suck it up for the sake of minorities in general? Because things have to get better. I don't always have to be comfortable with the conversation before it can happen. I have to sacrifice my comfortableness sometimes so that things can get better. So uh, st- staying on this topic, but just more of a specific question, I want, I'm interested now in how you feel about the concept. There's been a lot of controversy in the last couple of years, three years, maybe. How do you feel about the concept of the blind audition as it relates to people like you feeling like you want to just earn it with your voice? Wow. Obviously, the first thing that I would want to say is that's great. Like if you can't see who you're listening to, then it has to be just based on their voice. That's awesome. But also knowing that sometimes that doesn't allow for diversity. Like sometimes it might still end up being a non-diverse ensemble, which takes us back to, okay, the opportunities that minorities had throughout their life. Because being able to even take an audition, like say for an orchestra or even for the program I'm in right now, comes from years of privileges. And even me, I'm saying I'm extremely privileged to have gotten to where I am. The experiences I've had, the money that I've had to be able to afford certain auditions, living where I live, going to certain schools, it comes from from being kids mm-hmm. all the way up to be able to take that audition and to have um, the training and the practice necessary to take it. It's still lopsided, it's still not even. So the blind audition sounds like a good idea, but still, is that enough? Do we have to place more attention on seeing them and, and wanting to pick more minorities? And then is that fair? Is that unfair to non-minorities? It's, it's a really tough question to ask. And I think there just needs to be more research and more published so that people can understand the facts of what it takes. Right. Yeah, I think I, I, I mostly agree with all of that. The way I think of it kind of ties back to this earlier, the thing we, we talked about earlier with access to education. The blind audition sounds great unless you realize that that's, that only, that only does anything, does anything of any value for the ensemble in front of you in terms of getting the best voices. And that's important. We need to make music at at a really, really high level in our profession or else audiences don't come. And then, (laughs) and then the whole conversation becomes moot, but it doesn't fix the 
the the 15 years prior to that audition when certain kids in certain school districts depending on where they with the zip code they were born in weren't mm-hmm. getting trained uh, to do that. And so, so yeah, I think to me, there seems like my, my feeling about the blind audition has changed over the years as I've thought about it more and more. Uh, I, it used to, again, product of being born and raised in the eighties and nineties, it used to sound to me like the most fair possible way to do it. Um, because I didn't want anyone who's racist being the judge of the audition, <laughs> meaning, uh, cause that was, that was more a bigger fear back then was that somebody would just lit, watch a, an audition and it's not the right looking person. And so they wouldn't hire that person. Um, and so now I think more of a, it's gotta be a combination of, of that plus, the education stuff that like even your show or that you're working on or uh, educational initiatives that get into the cities, get into the parts of the, or even rural areas, to be honest, where music education is not being delivered in the same way as it is in some, you know, more affluent suburban schools, you know, that kind of thing. And so, yeah, I, I think, I think we're on the same page there. So on the way out, let's do this. I want you to just, if there's anything that, you want to talk about that is uh, tangential to this topic or any other topic that I just haven't given you a chance yet to say, like, what does the vocal music, the classical music world need to know from Deborah Stevens? I would want to say that it takes a lot to get here. It takes a lot of, like, it's kind of like the whole, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a lot of opportunities in order to be a successful classical musician just to get where I am, it's taken years of not only voice lessons, but I I couldn't start taking voice lessons until about a couple months before college is when I started because I couldn't afford to take both piano and voice. So I'm lucky in that sense that I happen to be more naturally gifted that I was still able to get in, but the money that it takes there and then even in high school, I was lucky to get scholarships in order to audition for things like Allstate. That's extremely expensive. And then driving down there in the hotel, so many little tears that you can get knocked off if you don't have the money mm-hmm. or if you don't know the right people. So um, there's an organization I want to shout out that's really doing an amazing job right now by trying to raise money for these people who can't afford instruments, who can't afford lessons that's one of the earliest things that can stop you immediately from ever getting to be a great musician is if you just can't afford these things what what's the which organization is it it's the lift music fund okay and is that so, like a is that a nonprofit? like you can donate to them and they they give out scholarships is that how it works yeah they are a nonprofit, and how they've been raising money recently is to um have musicians give benefit concerts. So I I did my own back in August where I sang and posted it on my page and people would donate while I was singing to the Lift Music Fund. Mm -hmm. So artists will be willing to give a performance and have that money go towards the Lift Music Fund. And they actually made $25,000 through doing that, which was, uh, forgive me if my math is wrong, but I think that's $100, $250 scholarships. I'm bad at math, so I'm just going to nod my head. Sounds great. (laughs) Something like that, however they want to divide it, a certain amount of students. And that 250 can help towards an instrument that can let someone get their instrument tuned or, you know, violin restrung. That's the ability to audition for like an honor choir. That's so many things that that can open up for a kid. That's a couple months of lessons. But that's just an important thing that I want people to realize. It takes a lot of money to get where I am. So it's not only that I was the best musician for the position, it's that I've been really lucky, I've been really blessed, and I've been a hard worker. Um, I'll mention when I wanted to apply for the Seraphic Fire Professional Choir Institute my junior year, or senior year, whichever it was, I only had $60 in my bank account. And that was for groceries. And that was for the headshots that I was going to need to apply for the application Mm -hmm. and other things that I would need that week. So the application, I think, was about 45. So I had to make $15 work for that entire week. And I used it for a friend that took pictures for me. He's a really good photographer, but he didn't even want money. But I gave him 15. 
and then I had to borrow $10 to buy PB&J and ramen noodles to live off of for the week so that I could use that $45 to send in the application. So for a week, I went around with no purchasing power and barely enough food to eat so that I could send in that application. And I think that that opportunity was amazing. I connected with so many people. I learned so much. It's on my resume. It's something that had really boosted me to the musician I have now. Mm -hmm. But that's the week long struggle I had to do just to be able to afford to send in an application. That's an amazing story. And and I, to me, I kept thinking about back to the very beginning of our conversation, when you're third grade or fourth grade, hearing, Shost uh, was it uh, Dvorak, not Shostakovich, uh, Dvorak, and, and being inspired uh, with a, a type of music that you really have had to fight for your whole life to be um, perceived as a part of, a part of that musical tradition. And then you go through that kind of, you know, pain and struggle to be, to get an opportunity like that with Seraphic Fire. Uh, to me, the lesson I take out of that is that as a teacher, because of course I come come to this and most of my audience are teachers and conductors and you know that kind of thing. And the way, the, the lesson I take out of that is what are we doing in our classrooms, in our choirs, in our uh, lessons, private lessons, whatever it is that we're doing uh, to, set, to set off our kids with a light in their eyes that makes music like like you love and music like I love possible for them. What what are we doing to make them see that it's possible for them? Because I think I, I think your story is an inspiration in that way. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I really enjoyed this conversation. That was lots of fun. It's been an honor, honestly. Thank you so much. As this episode comes out, many of you out there will be returning to some type of in-person instruction. Uh, so make sure as you're coming back into the classroom that you've got your resonant singers masks, you've got your sight reading factory memberships ready to go for you and all of your kids. You've got your Voce Vista video software. You've got your sheet music from Ryan Main, Graphite Publishing. You have all these resources with discount codes whenever you enter Coralosophy at checkout. See the perks of being a listener to this show are wonderful and can't be underestimated. So as you head back into the classroom, make sure you hit up those awesome vendors for some of their great products and use that code to get your discount. And thank you as always for sticking around and listening to a full high resolution conversation, especially one as important as that is. Of course, my story, Deborah's story, those aren't the critical important pieces to this. Everyone's got a story related to something like identity, how they see themselves, how they see themselves as a musician. And so my goal in presenting these conversations is to widen the net of what we think of in terms of identity. Lots of us think of ourselves as lots of different things. And I want to have these conversations with you. I want to have these conversations with my colleagues. And most importantly, I have these conversations with my students. These are the type, in my opinion, the types of conversations that we have to have to continue to move forward as a world, as a profession. So thank you for sticking around and listening to that. On the way out, there are all kinds of ways that you can help spread the word about this show. If you can't do anything financially to help the show, like joining the Patreon, making a purchase at one of the vendors, or making a donation, that's all fine. There are other things that you can do. Leave a comment leave a rating of some kind on any app that you use. Facebook has a way to do this. Really, anytime you interact in that way, it helps other people see the show without me having to spend ad dollars. So that's actually a way that you can, in a sense, donate to the show for free if you enjoy the content, if you find that it is valuable to you. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.